Last year, I purchased my first tarot deck, and as someone who gets anxiety when it comes to making decisions, I found the endless options of decks to be overwhelming. I mean, there's a deck in almost every theme imaginable. How could I know if the Pagan Cats deck was as legitimate as the classic Marseille deck? And anyway, was the Marseille deck even the original? I wanted to know more about the history, and I found that the narratives surrounding tarot's origins are many. The stories ranged from gypsies to ancient mythology, and often contradicted each other. To get a better understanding, I turned to occult historian and author, Mitch Horowitz. The earliest decks that we know of showed up in the early 15th century in northern Italy. And they were treated as a game, and we know this because there are manuscripts, catalogs, diaries that refer to this early card game with these trump images, images of Pope, images of the Empress, images of death, images of the fool, things that we come to associate with tarot cards today. In its earliest iteration, tarot was an ancestor to our modern game of bridge. So the origin story wasn't exactly as exciting as what I was expecting. What I thought would be an ancient tale of ageless wisdom actually turned out to have started as a parlor game. What people fail to understand is that games and passion plays and art, stained glass windows and other imagery were serious business during the Renaissance. When someone spoke of a game during the Renaissance, they didn't mean it like we mean Monopoly or Twister today. Then tarot traveled to southern France and people in southern France who were more interested in the early Renaissance in revived Egyptian philosophy and in ancient Hermetic philosophy began to imbue the deck with certain images of their own or began to change certain images and their meanings. But the idea was that these were communicating some sort of inner or spiritual development. By the early 1500s, Marseille had become the center of tarot production, and over the next few centuries, the ancient and mystical narratives surrounding tarot became solidified in the public mind, as various occultists and authors developed theories linking the deck and its images to ancient symbolism, often without any historical evidence. One of these occultists was Eliphas Levy. In 1854, he published a book called The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic. And in that book, for the very first time, this being the mid-19th century, he began to associate tarot with the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, with Kabbalah, with planets, with elements, with zodiac signs. So people walk around today with this notion that tarot is an ancient Egyptian mystery book that always had these correspondences to the elements, to the celestial bodies, uh, various alchemical symbols uh, to the Hebrew alphabet, uh, to the tree of life in Kabbalah. This was a mid 19th century invention. It doesn't mean there's not profundity to it and it doesn't mean there aren't insights to it. Traditions have to start somewhere. They don't just fall from the sky. And that tradition to a very great extent started with Elvis Levy in the mid 19th century. I was beginning to understand how the decks became associated with so many mystical schools of thought. As a self-aware species, we constantly try to define our existence, and this often means prescribing deeper meaning to things in order to understand ourselves. But I was still curious how the cards began to be used as a means of fortune-telling and divination. It's impossible to understand tarot without grasping that there is a mystical allegory in the cards. The images that appear in the tarot deck can rightly be called archetypes. They're images that have existed from our earliest recorded history of sorcerers and hermits and magicians and devils. All of these images have a heroic or frightening quality, a mysterious quality. They are primeval images. They are images not unlike some of the earliest human paintings that you'll find on cave walls, for example. Any tarot deck that you purchase today will be made up of 78 cards. This includes 56 minor trumps, or the minor arcana. It's made up of some variation of four suits, wands, cups, swords, and coins. Each of these suits are numbered 8 through 10 and also include four court cards, a king, a queen, a knight, and a page. 
but the major trumps, or major arcana, are what really make the deck. It's made up of 22 allegorical images that many associate with the human journey. Taking a look at the same major trump from several different decks, you'll notice the richness and detail that each individual card takes on. Even the minor trumps contain vibrant and suggestive images, but it wasn't always this way. British occultist Arthur Edward Waite rejected the unverified connections of tarot to things like ancient Egypt, astrology, and Kabbalah, but he recognized the mystical allegory in the cards and the powerful occult properties of the images. So in the early 20th century, he collaborated with artist Pamela Coleman Smith to create the most recognized deck in the English-speaking world today, the Rider Waite Smith deck. It was the very first time that a deck was produced that was not only used expressly for fortune telling, but in which all of the minor trump cards, all of the court cards, had these very alluring illustrations. It opened up the cards to almost this democratic occult renaissance, where suddenly cards that had been very difficult to decipher previously uh, seemed imbued with meaning. This is a replica of an early tarot of Marseille. Here is what a court card might have looked like. This is, say, the Nine of Cups. As you can see, there's no illustrations whatsoever. When you're trying to fortune tell and you pull a card like that, unless you have a very deep intuition for what's going on, it's very difficult from these sparsely illustrated uh, court cards or minor trumps to make a judgment call. So it was really, you know, the Smith images that opened up tarot to divination for every man and woman, the everyday person. And today, again, almost every deck that we have, whatever it's theme, whether it's vampires, whether it's Star Wars, whether it's Druidic, whatever contemporary theme people are working with remade for the 21st century, they are almost always riffing off of the images of Pamela Coleman Smith. So we all fight about the history of tarot, but the truth is there is a diplomatic and authentic whole where everybody has a little piece of the truth. These are archetypal images. They do tell stories. People feel that there, there is meaning in these frozen moments of time, at least a, a, a snapshot or a reflection of the immediate present, if not the future. And the, the methodology is, is very easy. So this tool has surpassed everything else from the occult culture, whether it be Ouija boards, maybe even daily horoscopes as the as the divinatory tool of, of choice. It's the ultimate democratic tool of the occult. So the idea that tarot is a book of ancient mysticism and ageless wisdom may not be backed by evidence, but it doesn't necessarily make the application of those ideas to those who practice it any less valid. When it came to choosing my deck, I took the advice from a friend and picked the one whose illustrations resonated with me the most because even though each deck reflects the beliefs of the artist who illustrated it, it's really the reader who will give the final meaning by their personal interpretation of the cards.